today. I do here. not see any uh, public today. So, but we'll just open the, the meeting for the bylaw review at 1202. Um, Michelle, I made you co host so you can um, monitor attendees and stuff. Good, thank you. Um, and I figured we would just pick up where we left off. I thought we were on like page 15 or so. Yeah. Okay. I did um, meet with KP Law this morning. Um, and we got through basically to the same point. Um, so I'm trying to schedule with him um, immediately before our meetings every, every week to keep up to date. But um, it's, <laughs> I think what we've sort of come to the conclusion of is just that how substantial these changes are, that it's almost like a full on rewrite, um, but we'll, um, cross that bridge as we come to it. I'll keep you guys in the loop as to what I'm doing as far as redrafting once we get through this first round. Um, so I'm trying does to that, remember, oh, go ahead. Does that have um, implications if it's a rewrite versus a revision? No, not really, because we still have to hold a public hearing. Um, okay. And it wouldn't be- curious. Yeah, it wouldn't be a rewrite in the sense of like just abolishing everything, but more like, uh, Comprehensively, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, all right, so I'm trying to remember where we left off, and I don't really. Um, we oh, so we had talked a lot at the last meeting about permits, um, and town permits under the bylaw versus state permits, and how we're going to reconcile that. Um, I did, um talk to uh, Alex at KP Law about that. And he was equally um, kind of confused about how to do it because it's it's not as straightforward as, you know, initially, first initially thought. So he's going to talk to some other towns that do, um, and it, that, that have a similar process and advise us on what to do and how to handle it. Um, you know, because there's no negative determination process under a request for determination. And under a notice of intent, if we required a notice of intent for bylaw project, there's that it would still have to be filed through DEP, which doesn't make any sense if it's bylaw only. So he will, he's going to check back with us. So this one's kind of, this section is kind of in a holding pattern, I guess, until we, um, get some guidance, legal guidance on how we should maneuver on, on permitting, local permitting as it relates to the state forms. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna move through here because I think this is about where we left off. These were some things that Alex and I looked at this morning, just adjusting the language, pretty simple stuff. Um, <clears throat> again, some, some rewriting things, like the way that this is written is just not um, very straightforward. So um, the commission may accept as the application and plans under the bylaw notice of intent and plans filed under the Wetland Protection Act. It's kind of weird the way it reads and so, um, we're hoping to sort of reword that, like any application that's submitted to the Conservation Commission must meet the Wetland Protection Act and bylaw submittal requirements. Um, and also note that the applications will be considered separately um, under the regulations. So as we issue, and I know that this is kind of probably confusing to you guys, because when, when we approve, say, an order of conditions, we say these are our special conditions and we're making a motion to approve. Um, but when I actually issue the document, I'm issuing one set of um, special conditions under Wetland Protection Act and one set of special conditions under the local bylaw. And usually I'm pretty careful about how I do that so as that the more 
I keep the conditions that can be better enforced under wetland protection, under wetland protection, and the ones that sort of um, go beyond wetland protection I put under the bylaw. So anyways, that just as a kind of background piece so that you guys know when the permits get issued, that's, that's what they look like. <clears throat> a lot of this language was not edited by me, just so that you guys know. And um, I also wanted to just for a second, I know we were talking about a butter notifications at the last meeting and there was that item about the um, 50 acre parcel. We're gonna um, add some language in there to um, make sure that there's no, there's no loophole on that one. I do you guys remember which one I'm talking about? Yeah. 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 Um, so here there's, there's a requirement that, um, the owner, that the owner sign the application and we just put in some language so that, um, it can be an legally authorized representative of the owner if the owner can't sign for some reason. Um, okay. So. I'm just gonna highlight this section because this is really important. So this number seven here, what this is essentially saying is that any project would require, and this is without limitation, a narrative description, calculations of pre and post peak flows and estimated water quality characteristics of any drainage discharge from a point source, whether closed or open channel outside a resource area. So this is important. That's a really important one for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> and it opens a big can of worms. Um, so under the Wetland Protection Act, there are certain, so there's, there's stormwater standards. And, and you guys probably remember with the solar project that I brought up a lot of stormwater related issues as far as compliance with those regulations. Um, those regs are really made for like commercial projects or large scale projects. They're not, they don't apply under state law to like a single family home, right? So like if I wanted to build a house, I wouldn't have to put in a detention basin and catch basins and stuff in my driveway. That would be reserved for like a Walmart parking lot or something like that because the, the drainage characteristics are very different for a small single family house lot than they are for a large scale development. And what this condition or this, um, section here says is basically that for any project um, within resource area, the commission could essentially require stormwater calculations. Um, and also whether or not the points, point source discharge is, um, and actually I should add discharge in here, um, whether or not the point source discharge is within the resource area or not. And that's really important because what that says is that a single family homeowner would have to do stormwater calculations. And stormwater calculations, I don't know if you guys can see me, but they're like this thick when you get a book. They're, they run, uh, it's done by an engineer. They run hydrology calcs. They look at um, um, drainage uh, catchment areas and assess um, pre and post drainage conditions. And it's, it's a lot of um, research and calculation and investigation. It requires test pits and stuff like that. So um, what, what we added here to was the commission may require at its discretion stormwater calculation. So if it's a very complex single family house lot, the commission could say they want to see stormwater calcs, but it wouldn't be required for somebody to put in a shed, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I... I... <laughs> So we're sort of removing some burden in this case for a single family home or, I mean, I like that it's up to our discretion. It would kind of be nice to have some kind of trigger for it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what that would be. I just, I'll just share this anecdotal thing. When I was yeah. talking to Leverett, the um, conservation agent, mm -hmm. He mentioned that they're pretty busy because there's not a lot of dry land left in Leverett, but there's still a lot of development pressure. 
So, you know, at some point that's probably going to happen everywhere. And I wouldn't want to make it too lax, um, just like to, you know, keep a hold on future development that may start encroaching upon wetter areas that um, we're not necessarily dealing with now, but might be, you know, the remaining developable lots in the future. Does that make sense? I just want to. Yeah. It. Yeah. No, I, it's, it's a good point. And I, I mean, I think that um we could we could think about making if you guys have suggestions for how we could put more teeth in this um without making it like a broad brush requirement you know i mean for somebody like i'll give you an example like recently we had a permit uh building permit application it's they're doing an in, inside home renovation on a house that has been there since like the 1700s <coughs> or 1800s or whatever and so they're doing this huge interior renovation and they're putting a little mud room on the front, like an entryway, literally one post piling to put this little mud room on, but it's in riverfront area. So like in this, in, in, and it, it almost even calls into question, like, do they need to file a wetland permit? I mean, it's, I told them yes, just to be kind of really, um, you know, conservative about how I'm applying the law, but under this, it would mean they would need to do runoff calculations for adding like a five foot by five foot mudroom onto their house. And um, you know, I want to I want to make sure it's fair, but at the same time, re, you know, that it's it's reasonable and that it's strong for us to. Right. Well, I think the way that you put it, like, leaves it up to our discretion, literally. So, I mean, that's good. It's just. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, as long as there's understanding about mudroom versus, a, you know, a huge addition to your house on Riverfront, because mm -hmm. I mean, I don't I don't have any better suggestions. I guess I'm just calling out what I could see as this being complicated in the future, no matter what. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I, uh, I feel you, Michelle, I'm wanting a trigger. <clears throat> I have a little nervousness about writing one into the law. Obviously, comics change the law, but uh, I have a feeling that conditions might change quicker than the laws do in the future. So, uh, to Aaron, is there any way we could, I don't know, I guess I'm thinking of like a memorandum of understanding, mm -hmm. uh, but less or so, maybe just a verbal one, when we next meet with a full commission where we could come up with some internal number that we like as a trigger, let's say any projects that effect over 5,000 square feet or something like that. I'm just writing this down. I feel like I was thinking about like a square foot area, but that doesn't always necessarily translate into impacts, right? So it's like, could be a smaller than that, but in a more sensitive area. And so they would come under the thresholds, but it shouldn't. So yeah, yeah I don't know. Um, so maybe, you know, just leaving it up to our discretion is the most powerful way to do it and just cross the bridges when we come to it. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, well, we can think about this, too. We've got lots of time. So let's leave it as is right now. Um, but let's Last question on that, Erin, if you yeah, don't mind. Of course. Uh, because you have all the experience here. How often would you say that like, comes up is like uh, you would like to have the ability to have the discretion uh, so yeah um on a single family house lot i've okay so i'll give you one example in leroy i think you were there for this one um remember that house in the riverfront area it's number 74 east hat uh east leverett road um it, it's on the other side of the road from cushman brook and it was like up on this hill yep do you remember which one I'm talking about? Yeah, because I got lost going to the site visit, but I eventually found it. Okay. Yeah, I thought I remembered you being there. And remember, I insisted that they have a stone or um, uh, grass swale running along their driveway? Yep. That was a good example right there of where, because of the steepness of the driveway and it being paved, and also because of snow removal and snow storage issues, 
what I envisioned happening was that they were just going to pull the snow down and store it in the in the riverfront area at the toe of the driveway. And I didn't want that happening. And they had no other place to put it. So that's why I suggested that swale. So they'd have a place to push the snow to the side where it could um, where it wouldn't, you know, cause runoff erosion damage and it would have like a storage place, but it would also offer some filtration before it gets to the bottom of the hill and goes into the catch basin to go into Cushman Brook. So there has been examples where I've incorporated stormwater elements into single family plans, but I wouldn't necessarily require pre and post runoff calculations or, you know, um, mm -hmm that type of thing. So it's, you know, it's kind of tricky. And I mean, as, as this is written, you could, you could literally allow, require stormwater calcs for any application that comes through and, or whether or not the discharge points are within a resource area or not, you could still require it, which is kind of crazy because it's like saying we have jurisdiction outside our jurisdiction in some way. Um, I don't know. And, and part of this is like, like, let's say we required somebody to do it, right? Let's say we required somebody to go through the stormwater design process and they said, no, we're not doing it. We think this is unreasonable and we're going to appeal and take it to a superior court. If a superior court judge looked at this, they'd be like, that's not reasonable, you know, to require somebody to have a stormwater calyx for a shit, you know? So I think that at least having the discretion element there, um, makes it like on a case by case basis, at least. Um, so anyway, I don't want to belabor this and get hung up too much yeah. on it, but um, I like this question. That... I'm sorry I brought us into the rabbit hole. Just um, Oh no, it it's seems, good. It seems That's to why... cover the circumstances that we would encounter. Yeah, and it's good that we're talking about this, and that's the whole point. We're not trying to, <clears throat> we're not trying to um, rush this through. We we do want to move it if we can quickly, but at the same time, we want to talk about these important ones. Um, <clears throat> this one below number eight <laughs> is I'm not going to really get into the language of it, but basically what it's saying is if a violation occurs, um, and so it should really be under the enforcement section, this particular statement. And so um, I when I talked with counsel this morning, they said, yeah, let's move that into the enforcement section. So I will do that. <clears throat> um, <laughs> I'm like poorly written, poorly written. I'm, you know, I like simplicity. So um, public hearings on application for notice of intent, for permit, for notice of intent permit, whatever it is, however it's written, I just didn't like it. I would rather just say public hearings and just talk about public hearings in general. Um, <clears throat> Let me see. Yeah, run on sentences. I don't like, um, which is required to notify the owner. Um, <clears throat> so on this, notice of the hearing shall be communicated by the commission or its representative to the applicant and to the owner, if other than the applicant. Um, I don't really think that that should be the commission's responsibility to do that. I think that should be the obligation of the representative to relay the information of the um, hearing dates and times to the owner. It's just anything that we do that puts a burden on us um, administratively. I, I, we, we already have a huge administrative burden in terms of everything that we're dealing with. So I would rather that the burden be on the applicant. I like it. Good catch. <clears throat> um, this is a standard practice here. It's it states it and it's kind of restating. I one of the things when we when I kind of get a, a clean draft going is removing this redundancy because this is already stated just a few paragraphs above. Um, <clears throat> Notice shall be sent to any person at the hearing who so requests in writing. Um, we, there was another section like this up above and, you know, this is simple in the sense of like, if, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, cause I know recently we did have a project, uh, I guess it was the, 
it was the when when we were doing the anrad for the solar project there was a lot of continuations and there was a lot of abutters who were following it and um it got to be to the point where we would open a hearing and there'd be like 30 abutters on the call and then we they they would come on the call just for us to tell us oh the hearing has been continued another you know 30 days and so it was wasting everybody's time so i think that this is more so like a um uh courtesy you know if if a group of abutters say could you just keep us posted on when the um, meeting was post is postponed to if there's ongoing continuations i guess i just it makes me um nervous the way it's worded that it's the onus is always going to be on us and there is really no under state law no legal onus for us to notify abutters if there's a continuation so i don't know how you guys feel about that and i'm really interested in your opinion on it well so in that circumstance where they log in to find out that it's been continued is the fact that it's been continued on the agenda which is posted publicly like for me i'm necessarily always, well could it be i mean that so seems if, the easiest so we post our hearings our agendas i post them the friday before our meeting and the meeting is the following wednesday so ordinarily they're only required to be posted 48 hours in advance but i post them um quite a bit more in advance and so sometimes um applicants will say oh you know what we're not going to have revisions in time and they'll they'll send them they'll send me an email on monday after the agenda has already been posted saying there's a continuation um i mean is it easier to then just update the agenda or add some like text line on the website that says something or i don't I, so i don't know about that one but then you added that people want to be po um like kept notice about the the postponed date like they just i, I guess i yeah. always come back to like can we just like put this on the website and refer people to that well, and the thing is, as a courtesy, I always try to communicate to people, like shoot them an email, tell them. We always, even like, I'm, I know you guys noticed Jen at the beginning of meetings will say, by the way, this application withdrew, so you don't have to sit through, you know, three hearings to find that out. Um, but the, I guess the question is, do we want it in our regulations? Because we, we do try to be courteous in general, but like this says yeah. notice shall be sent. Um, I mean, no, I don't think so. I would strike it, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful, I like it. Okay, <clears throat> I apologize too, is I've been having some, because there's so many edits to this, I've been having some um, formatting issues coming up, but we'll just keep moving. Um, so this is just rewording. I'm not going to go over these changes with you. They're not really substantive. Um, the commission or its representative shall provide access to, okay, so this is a change, this top one coordination with other boards, and this is a rewrite on my part. So let me know if this is okay with you. The commission or its representative shall provide access to elect an electronic version of the permit application to the planning board, board of health, inspections, and town engineer, um, or building commissioner, uh, planning board, board of health, town engineer, and building commissioner. I do this on, on your board packets are copied to all of these parties. So, but I just did an electronic version as opposed to, um, applicants needing pr to provide hard copies to all those parties because I feel like that's a complete waste of paper. Yeah, that's like an anachronism. Um, these boards can um, provide written comments like, so if the building inspector had a problem or the Board of Health had a problem, they could provide us with comments. But this is just kind of the way that it's written. And these are more notes to myself to sort of rewrite this so it's a little more clear, um, which the commission shall take into account, but which shall not be binding to the commission. Like, 
I don't really like the way that's worded. M more so like the commission can take these comments into a, an account or not, you know. Um, stop me at any point if you guys want to talk about any of this. You don't think it's important to say that they're not binding? You just think it's... More no, I... I do think it's important to say, I just don't like the way it's stated. I just want to re wordsmith it a little bit. So it's more just like this little comment here is just a um, place mark for me to adjust the wording. And, and once I, I'll go through this whole document once we're done um, and we get through page 44, I'll go through this whole document and rewrite these sections that I think aren't well-written. And you guys can look at the old version and the new version and say, I like it or not, you know, and figure it out. Mostly I don't like anything that is not crystal clear the way it's written. If it's if it's um too much too much verbiage, I I try to pull it out and just keep it simple. <sighs> yeah, I these little these little notes um so one of the things we're going to have to do is take out these all of these references to the wetland protection act um the town attorney gave me sort of a a boilerplate um language to use which would be um I don't have it right in front of me, unfortunately, but it's something to the effect of um, <clears throat> the um, standard Wetland Protection Act requirements shall apply other than specifically referenced. And then if, if we have additional requirements that go beyond what the Wetland Protection Act requires, then we would list those. But we don't have to keep referring back to these sections of the Wetland Protection Act. They don't, it's not good for bylaws to, to do that because um, the town attorney doesn't want those in there. I agree with changing that up, Aaron, but I'm wondering if the original intent for that was to give some sort of um, reference points to the public. So I'm wondering if maybe at the end of this document, when it finally comes out, there could be some list of reference laws for the public to check on. Yeah, I, I agree. Something like, so notice of non-significance is, is capitalized. So it's a term, I assume, within the, the wetland reg. So maybe like um, like a, a terms list, like what, is, what do they call? <laughs> what? A glossary, old school. Yeah, it's something where you can look up what a notice of non-significance is and what it's bound by or what its teeth are, whatever. Just because otherwise, like, you know, even when I read this, I have no context. And when I see that there's a citation for wetlands regs, I'm like, okay, that's where it's from. So, mm -hmm. I mean, to somebody like you, it's totally unnecessary, but um, it is useful in clarity <laughs> for other people. Yeah. And, and, and just for the sake of, you know, um, I guess, understanding as we're going through this document, a notice of non-significance is exactly what it sounds like. It's basically like, let's say somebody files a notice of intent and says, we want to do all this work. We don't think any of the work has significance to any of the provisions of the Wetland Protection Act. And I want you to just no issue a notice of non-significance. <laughs> That's what that's there for. And I have literally never seen or heard of a commission ever doing that. Um, cause it's like, it's always and significant. It, well, I was just using, <laughs> I know, I know, but it's a good uh, point in the sense of what Leroy mentioned that we should use it as an opportunity to educate people and also point toward what it's referring to. So I'll figure that out. I'll figure something about that out for you guys and, and I'll run it by you. Um, once we get to that point, but I think it's a good point. Um, okay, 
Um, it was already stated above that the Conservation Commission can impose conditions. The first sentence is superfluous. We should combine these sections to be comprehensive. I don't get the condition limiting. Hold on. Uh, I need to. quality or quantity of discharge. This makes no sense to me. The applicant either meets the regulations or they don't. I don't see how the commission can control discharge volume other than stormwater. So let's just look at this because this is kind of important here. The permit shall impose conditions upon the activity or the portion thereof that will in the judgment of the commission result in removing, dredging, filling, building upon, or altering a resource area. The permit shall impose conditions setting limitations on the quantity or quality of discharge from any point source, whether closed or open channel, when said limits are appropriate to protect the interests identified in the bylaw. So do you guys see what I'm saying about that? Like, we're not going out there at somebody's discharge point and taking a water sample and testing the quality or quantity of the water that's coming out of it, ever. Um, we would be making sure that what they what they have um, proposed as far as their plan meets the regulations. And if it meets the regulations, then the assumption is that the quantity and quality of discharge is being controlled um, effectively. Does that make sense? I mean, it makes perfect sense to me. I'm kind of just wondering, do you have any idea why this is in there in the first place? Like what the intent was, original intent? Yeah, I mean, and and I think that's a great point, Leroy. I would, I would sort of guesstimate that the reason for that is, so let's just say, for example, the commission um, permits a given uh, stormwater um, design and that I'll use I'll use um, Aspen Heights as an example. So Aspen Heights is um, a development that's on Route 9 uh, Northampton Road. It's sort of um, you know where Domino's Pizza is right across from Stop yeah, and Shop. Know, yeah. It's kind of that big one that's like right behind there. They had a couple stormwater structures and they're called level spreaders. So what the way that it was designed was uh, these the system collects water under the driveway, infiltrates it, and then there's sort of an emergency outlet for these two level spreaders. And essentially, they're only supposed to be wet like during major rainstorms, but most of the time they're supposed to be dry. But whenever I went out there to inspect them, they were always standing water ponds. And I, I think that the reason for this condition is for situations like that where whatever was approved isn't really functioning as it was intended. Um, and to your original point, we can't really regulate that, right? We can just regulate the original intent. We can regulate the plan but once it's in and they satisfy the original conditions. Then. Yeah, well, so we can to some degree. So what happened with that particular situation was I met with the engineer out there and they had, there's like, there was a couple issues. There's a high groundwater table, um, but they also still had erosion controls in, which were basically damming up the, the level spreader. And since they've removed those, it's been functioning quite a bit better. Um, but there's also other things we can do. So like in our conditions, we require um, inspections logs. We require um, maintenance logs to make sure that they're inspecting and cleaning these systems. Because a lot of times the quality and quantity of discharge can depend if they're not adequately cleaning these systems out when they're supposed to, which is part of the order of conditions. So like that, why I brought that example up was I asked them for their maintenance logs and they didn't provide them to me. And then it was like radio silence and I'm like, okay. So, you know, I think that uh, one thing we might want to do there is to say, something to the effect of um, systems must function as they are as they were designed and intended to function and if they're dysfunctioning then 
or if they're causing resource area damage, maybe, then the applicant would need to come back to the commission to address that. Does that seem um, like a good kind of different way to say this? <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm sort of surprised that we have so little say after the fact, as Leroy was saying, because, you know, water rainfall changes, it's changing. And um, if something is not working, then it's just, there's no repercussions, which that seems odd to me. Well, there, there are repercussions. So, and let me talk about that really quickly. Um, just, and again, this is an educational process. So I wanna make sure that we're talking about these things so that you guys can, can learn. And I'm, I know Leroy has been through this a little bit. So the reason that this came up was because the applicant applied for a request for certificate of compliance. And I know, Michelle, you've seen one or, you know, you've seen a couple of these come through, but when the request for certificate of compliance comes in, that's when I start saying, well, I need an as-built plan. I need maintenance logs. I need, um, you know, inspection logs. I need uh, a sign-off from an engineer that everything was built to spec. Um, and if any of those things aren't in order, like uh, at Vista Terrace, remember we saw runoff and um, erosion over there on West Street recently. And I said, I don't recommend we issue a certificate of compliance on this until the site is stable. If they do something that is like far-fetched and their permit isn't functioning, we don't have to issue a certificate of compliance. And that's a really powerful thing because what that means is there's an encumbrance on the deed. So if the owner wants to sell, they can't, or they have to notify the person they're selling to. And usually that requires holding an escrow, which is a huge amount of money um, to make sure that the, the issue is resolved. So we do have the power, but uh, it's really when the commission wants to exercise that power. Um, and sometimes it can cause a lot of people to get very, very upset. Um, I've had somebody dive across a table during a concom meeting to try to strangle me over one of these because oh. they built they built like thirty feet closer to the wetland, and I didn't. Re I recommended that we not issue a certificate of compliance, and they. It was in you know it it's a basically a bad mark on the deed for the property. So when they do a title search to try to sell it, they can't. Well, thank you for that education. Um, I, I do like what Leroy was saying, like to maybe try and understand the original intent and make it more clear or, you know, consistent with um, an actual power law. Okay, I, I do, I do think that that is important. And I think um, I'm just going to highlight that all these ones that are like these important items that need to be addressed. Um, I think we should incorporate that. Okay, so let's see. Um, yeah, so this is another one of those um, this one right here, we'll have to change that. Um, permits can definitely under state law be extended. So I don't recommend that we tell people they can't extend permits. It just creates a nightmare. If somebody's in the middle of working on something and they haven't, it might not be their fault that they couldn't complete it within three years. Um, so they should have the opportunity to do an extension. There are conditions though that I added further down the line here for when an extension is appropriate. So we'll get to that. Um, I have to find out, I have to get an answer to this question from DEP and from our town attorney, because we have these, we have like so many hard copies of Well and Protection Act applications and permits. And I wanna find out right now we're keeping a hard copy and an electronic copy of all application materials. And I kind of want to find out if we, if we can just move to electronic. Um, uh, 
this is uh, this question right here is one that I want to talk to the town town council about or town attorney about. We haven't gotten to this point yet, but we will. Um, him and I left off on page 16 when we were going through today, but um, this says that we can't revoke a, a permit without holding a public hearing, which would mean notifying a butters and posting a legal ad. And I don't think that that's necessary. Um, I think one thing to keep in mind was is the original bylaw that was written in Amherst was written by a consultant by a wetlands consultant who did private consulting. And so something like this would be really um, important for a consultant because it means if their client commits an egregious violation, the commission can't just revoke the permit. They have to go through this administrative process to do it. And why should we go through an administrative process if we don't have to? Um, I think we should have the power to revoke it just during a regular meeting uh, that's a quorum of the board if we if the commission so chooses to. Um, so I'll, I'll double check on that just to make sure that we're on solid ground, but that might be something I will try to strike. Okay, so this says the commission may combine, the commission may combine the permit or other action on an application issued under the bylaw. <laughs> an application, that should be a permit, um, with the order of conditions issued under the Wetland Protection Act. So remember I mentioned earlier that we keep the conditions separate under the Wetland Protection Act and the bylaw. This condition says that we can combine them. You don't want to do that because what happens when it goes to appeal is that they won't. If so, like, let's say, for example, I issue an order of conditions and somebody appeals it. There's two courses for the appeal. One is mass DEP and the other in a town that has a local bylaw is superior court. Usually the appeals run concurrent to one another. So they're going one course through DEP with their appeal on the Wetland Protection Act side, and they're going one course through Superior Court on the bylaw side. That's how it's supposed to work. Now, if there is one document of conditions, so essentially it's all combined into one, uh, a Superior Court judge would just throw it out and say, there's no separate permit here for the local bylaw, so I'm not taking any action. And it's happened many, many times. That's why that um, that's why they DEP actually requires when you're issuing an order of conditions to keep them separate. So that needs to be adjusted accordingly. Feel free to jump in with questions if I'm um, anything I say isn't clear, guys. I don't want to feel like I'm dominating here. but we are making progress. We're, we've, we're almost to page 20. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so remember earlier I was talking about extensions and it said you can only issue a, a three year, or you can only, a permit is only valid for three years and basically says there's no extension process. There is an extension process. There's actually a specific permit for an, an extension on an order of conditions. However, or actually an order of conditions and I believe on an ORAD as well. So an order of resource area delineation. However, these conditions in those cases are extremely important. Um, and we've run into major problems because these conditions weren't followed. So a site visit to visually confirm that resource area boundaries have not changed. So when you're dealing with a permit that's 20 years old, which recently, and actually we still have a valid one that's over 20 years old, where the boundaries changed dramatically and we never, nobody went back to, 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 uh, to document that. And so now there's the, old house lots are really close to the wetland and we could have basically restricted that from happening if we had gone out and checked it. 
Um, <laughs> the flagging and wetland markers have to be present and complete as we're approved on the original permit. And this is really important because like when I go out to do an inspection, if I see where the original flag was sitting and there's a huge wet basin that expands 30 feet beyond that flag, I know that the wetland boundary has changed and they need to, we need to just let the permit expire and have them file a new permit or amend their existing permit. Um, <laughs> no existing enforcement on the property. Uh, if, if they want a continuation, they have to resolve their enforcement issues. Um, and then just the changes in resource area boundaries would trigger change. I think it's a really wise move to, uh, what is that number one, uh, about keeping the original flagging. Yeah. To that pretty consistently. Yeah. And people, cons uh, applicants, owners hate that because the flagging after like a year or two is completely gone. Um, it, it just deteriorates. And that's the other reason why we, like on Tofino, required um, a metal rebar marker. But <laughs> then again, that's an example of one where the wetland expanded significantly. So you have a rebar marker, but the wetlands expanded beyond that boundary. So um, we will know in the future if it's expanded or not one way or the other. So <laughs> this is really funny. Um, K number one here, this is completely illegal. Uh, the commission, its agents, officers, and employees shall have the authority to enter on privately owned land at reasonable times for the purpose of performing their duties under the bylaw. Um, survey sampling that deems necessary under the constitution and laws of the United States and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So that is trespassing. <laughs> and I definitely cannot and would not ever enter private property without the permission of the landowner. Um, it will not be, it will not hold up in court. If I trespassed on somebody's land, took pictures to document a violation and then left and filed a enforcement order, the, the DEP would throw the enforcement order out because I was trespassing. Um, you can view it from a neighboring property. You can view it from the air, like with a drone. Um, you can get permission from the landowner, but you cannot just enter their property without their permission. So that section definitely needs to be adjusted. Can I just ask one thing about that? Yep. I agree. Um, and so it would, it would be then changed to may enter with the permission of the landowner and something, but do we need, so, so that's sort of taking away a right to, um, check the site out. So is there some requirement that we have to at some point be let on to observe the property or else they don't get approved? Like, is there some backup somewhere? Okay. Excellent point. Sorry. Um, yeah, so two things, Michelle, to your question. Number one, if there's an active permit on the property, it's always a boilerplate condition that I can enter the site. So, so if somebody has an active order of conditions, I can enter the site because they've granted me their permission to do so. So that's number one. Um, any site with a active permit has already been granted permission for me to enter. If, if there was a site that had an egregious violation and we needed to get on site and the landowner was refusing us access, we can actually get a warrant and the other thing is, and I've done this before, you can call the environmental police. And in Massachusetts, the environmental police don't need a warrant to enter property if there's a um, in environmental damage caused uh, or reported. So I could, I have gone um, with an environmental police officer onto a site and um, that was really fun. Um, <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. So there's some recourse or something we have. Okay. Yeah. Big long section on enforcement, which is nice. And you can see there's not a lot of edits to the enforcement section, which is a really good thing. Uh, yeah. I mean, if there's one section that you want to be solid, it's this. So it's good that you're not seeing a lot of edits on here. 
Um, sorry, I I'm I wish I could scroll to the right. I don't know why this document's not letting me do that. Um, So I have to ask, I, I really need to talk to the town to, to the town attorney on this one. There's several sections in our in, uh, enforcement section about fines, issuing fines to people. Um, it kind of speaks to the vintage of when these were written um, because this has changed quite a bit. Um, fines are not really the way to go. Um, and I'll tell you why. So in order to issue a fine, you actually have to write a ticket. And we don't really have tickets in the wetlands uh, conservation department here in town. What you would do is use like, so the inspection department does have tickets, um, like building inspectors. So if there's like a building violation, like somebody's doing electrical work without a permit, they can issue a violation. But in order to, to actually follow through with these as these are written, what you would have to do is have one of those tickets and basically write them a ticket every single day, almost like a parking ticket. And you have to send each of those tickets to them every single day and you have to keep a stack of them like this and you go after them. And that's when they're talking about here, like the town collector may um, go against the property owner and place a lien. Um, it's very similar to like a parking ticket, you know, like if you park a car at a, um, uh, you know, uh, a metered station and you don't pay that you can just keep getting tickets. So it's, it's kind of similar to that. Um, but really the, the, the appropriate course, which has kind of been a learning process since the Wetland Protection Act came into effect is that if somebody's in violation, you issue them enforcement order. If they don't comply with the enforcement order, town council or town, the town attorney would then go after them and file charges against them. And, that's, and that is the correct path of action as opposed to us getting involved in fines. Um, so there might be some um, adjustment that needs to be made here for us to um, account for that difference. And um, I have to get to that section with the town attorney to make sure that that's um, adequate and up to date. So I guess I'd be a little bit worried about uh, losing the ability to find. We've only used it once, but that guy came around very quickly. <laughs> he did, but he never actually got a ticket and he never actually paid a fine. All right. It was more so him, Hartwood. Or, or no, nope. It was Canton Ave, right, Leroy? Yeah. 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 I yeah. forget Jones name. But. So you just threatened him with a fine? And also how much was the fine? Is it well, like uh so the fine is spelled out um as far as what we can do every day, but so I can't speak to it completely because I was actually out on maternity leave um when that occurred. Um, but I came back on the tail end of that, um, $300, $300 per violation per day. Okay. Per day. So it's, it's got, um, it, it's motivating. Well, and, and we may want to leave it in there for the motivating factor of it, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, but at the same time, keeping in mind that that is kind of the only applicable place for it is to threaten people, in my opinion, to come into compliance. Um, and really, ultimately, our, our strongest legal recourse is to sue them if they're not complying um, through, through our town attorney. Um, so, um, because when I, <laughs> go ahead. Well, when I came... When I came back from maternity leave, he had had like a month of fines. And so that would have meant somebody would have had to write him a ticket every single day 
for 30 days straight have those tickets documented by day with the amount and they would have had to have been sent to him every single day and that didn't happen so i came in sort of on the tail end after 30 days um after the fine had been issued and i was like trying to figure out how do i backtrack on this and i called town council and said this is the situation and they said oh no give them till like the end of next week and if they don't respond then I will basically just um, start a lawsuit against them. And um, I contacted their attorney and by the end of the week, they were, they were in lockstep. So um, it ended up being fine, but um, mind the pun. Well, the end, there, <laughs> there was a threat of the lawsuit more than the fine that had them. That is, that does seem to have more motivating effect. Um. It's tough to say, Leroy. I don't know if it was just because I had been gone and it was kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, we'll just wait till Aaron gets back. I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, it's tough to say what motivated them. And I think at the end of the day, my goal with enforcement is just to get people to come into compliance, you know, and work with us. And so ultimately, that's what happened. So um but we do need some clarification on this. And I'm not saying that we take out the fines altogether, but we might want to do a little um, adjustments of some of the language. Wow, we only got through 22. Oy, oy, oy. Um, okay, so here's another example in a timely manner. I feel like that's really vague. Um, I think that we should probably say something like 30 days or even 14 days um, for a vi violation. Um, I think a timely manner is something that's just, it's not really a, a certain amount of time. I totally agree. All timely manner should be struck from the document. It's <laughs> completely subjective. Yeah. Um, so what do you guys think then? What do you think is reasonable? Like in, in the mm. case of an enforcement, um, I'm good with your original 30 days because that generally is two meetings for us. Uh, we've seen a lot of people have holdups for various things. I wouldn't mind giving them the full 30. Michelle, how do you feel about that? Yeah, 14 seemed like kind of quick. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, yeah, as long as we don't think 30 is too long. But... I mean, I my only... Um... I guess comment on that is that we um, just the commission needs to be uh, very specific about what their expected deliverables are within the 30 day window. And the reason I say that is like, if we say, oh, well, we want this cleaned up within 30 days again, it's discretionary and subjective, but if we say we want a survey, we want this reflagged, we want a redesign of the engineered plan and we want it all within 30 days, then it's like, okay, you know. <laughs> Is that probably what we'd write into it? Because in that, in that respect, 30 days seems like a reasonable time period, a timely manner, um, but it would be like on our third meeting. So we would go through two meetings Right. And then they'd probably deliver. Yeah. I don't know how big of a deal that is, but if we're going to ask for all that, I guess, yeah, 30 days is seems reasonable. Yeah. Well, um, so we are behind schedule, pretty significantly behind schedule, but honestly, um, I think this is great. And everything that we're talking about, I think we're going at a good pace in terms of the content. It's gonna start going faster in some ways because um, once we get down, I'll just show you guys really quickly. I know, I know I'm gonna respect your time and not um, uh, go over, but um, we start getting into the resource area specifics. And some of that I might sort of skip over for, good reason and we can talk about that once we get to it um for right now but um but we're getting there we're only a few paid 
two or three pages away from there. So uh, we're, we're, we're getting there, we're making good progress and it's a good learning experience, I think, just to talk about it. So, and to get to know our bylaw really well. So, yeah. so um, I am good for today and happy to um, carry on on February 18th with our next round. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. And there are no attendees today, so I'll just close the meeting at 101. Sounds good. Thank you guys so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. See you it. Wednesday, guys. All right. Bye. Bye, guys. Take care.